it is time for a big D&D announcement. It's phenomenal, it's fantastic, but most of all, it is fabulous. On October 19th, D&D will release Fizzbin's Treasury of Dragons. This quintessential reference guide explains everything there is to know about D&D's most iconic monsters, dragons. It's got all the lore and stats you need to add a dragon to your adventure, how to play a dragon, fight a dragon, center a story around a dragon, and it's framed as if the entire book is based on Fizzbin the Fabulous's notes on dragons. Here to help us dive deeper into this book is the project lead, James Wyatt. Hello, James. Do we have you? Hello. How are you doing today? Here I am. I'm doing great, thanks. How are you? Good, man. Welcome to D&D Live. Thanks. It's good to be here. Well, I mean, I'm in the Wizards of the Coast office in Renton right now, but it's good to be talking to you. You know, this, through the wonders of technology, we're all connected now, right? That's right. So let's just jump right into it. How did Fizzbin's Treasury of Dragons come into being? Well, I spent months with some dwarven miners laboring in the word mines as a bunch of uh, talented writers and editors. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, Ray Winninger, actually the head of the D&D studio, was sort of the creative impetus behind this. Uh, in a lot of conversations with the, the leadership of the D&D studio, he realized that we had a lot to say about dragons that would be fresh and new for the game. And fundamentally, it just felt like it was time. You know, we've done monster books previously, Volos and Mordenkainen's, and they'd barely scratched the surface of, of what's out there with dragons. So this is, it's time. It's dragon time. You know, that is one thing I always say, that there are surprisingly few dungeons and surprisingly few dragons and Dungeons and Dragons. So I'm glad the supreme species is finally getting their due, right? <laughs> we are setting out to write that imbalance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about the book do you think will excite both players and dungeon masters the most? Did I mention it has dragons? You know, it um, is self-validating, that is true. <laughs> so for players, I think you'll find tons of inspiration for crafting a character whose story is tied to a dragon. You might play a dragonborn character. We are offering new options for dragonborn races. Um, you might play a new subclass, a ranger with a, a drake companion or a monk who channels draconic energy, or we've got a, a table full of ideas to help you take any character's story and tie it in with dragon stuff. So you might decide, you're playing a circle of the land druid, but part of the reason for your magical power is that you're tied to the land, which is part of the the uh, the terrain, the region around a dragon's lair, part of a dragon's territory, and so that dragon's magic is seeping into you through the land. Or maybe you're a warlock with an archfey patron, and that archfey patron happens to be a moonstone dragon, which is a new kind of dragon introduced in this book. So lots of of ideas and inspiration for for players to play with. Okay. Well um, Warlock with a From dragon patron, that, that in and of itself is just like, I mean, I'm sold. I'm just going to leave all my money on the table here when we're done for this, yes. But sorry, yes, for the awesome. Dungeon Masters. <laughs> for, for the Dungeon Master, this is, um, this is a book you can just open up and use at the table right away. That was our, our guiding principle. Um, so if you want an adventure hook, um, we've got about 20 tables that will help you come up with adventure ideas of, of, on the spur of the moment. Um, dragon quirks, layer maps. What's in a treasure? What's a, a particular item, uh, art object in a brass dragon's lair? Um, if you need a giant horde-sized mimic to challenge an eighth-level party, we, we got you covered. Just open up the book and go. I mean, who doesn't need a giant dragon-sized horde mimic, honestly? But, you know, a part of this D&D Live in particular is both for the OG players, but also brand new people who, who may have never actually gotten to play D&D. So in what ways could this book entice new players into the game? So I think of this book as like a giant toy box full of stuff for players and DMs to pick and choose things to bring into their game. Um, in that sense, it's not really designed with new players as its primary audience. But, did I mention the book has lots of dragons in it? Um, so my hope is that a new player who reads through the book will fall in love with the unique and distinctive dragons of D&D and then like, have their minds exploded open to all the vast multiverse of possibility that D&D offers. Um, that's really what I love about the book. It's like this giant collection of what if and imagine this. 
So lots of um, pointers in, in all sorts of wild directions. Yeah, you mentioned just a second ago that the, the dragons will be having effects on the land around them and, and affecting things like physically. Uh, based on Fisben's treasury, uh, dragons are both in and of the world of D&D. Can you tell us more about what that means and how that might manifest in a game scenario? Sure. So the, there's this sort of key bit of mythology that runs through the book is the idea that dragons were part of the creation of the material plane itself. So their fundamental nature is part of the material plane. And the beauty of this story is that it explains what we already see in the game. It explains why dragons hoard treasure, it explains how their magic alters the world around their lairs with the regional effects that are right there in the monster manual. And it explains why ancient dragons are like the most powerful creatures that are native to the material plane. But then we're, we're riffing on that idea through this book with the notion that every dragon has echoes across the material plane. Um, so a dragon in the Forgotten Realms might have an echo in the world of Eberron or a Greyhawk. And these various echoes are sort of nebulously bound together by fate. So it's sort of this minor motif running through that if you want your D&D campaign to sort of open up to the vast possibility of the, the multiverse, um, all these many worlds, there are ways to highlight that throughout the tunnels of a dragon's lair. You know, uh, m multiversal storytelling is in right now, I gotta say. So, uh, <laughs> now, uh, I do know that eggs and hordes are a newly defined mechanic in this book. Uh, how could a player or a dungeon master use these in their upcoming adventures? So, neither of these are really new mechanics so much as just new ways of thinking about aspects of dragon life. So. We have got a, a discussion of eggs in the book that's really meant to drive home the point that a dragon is not just a big lizard. Dragons are richly magical creatures that are tied to the creation of the material plane. So uh, for DM inspiration, you might decide for your campaign that dragon eggs grow on a primordial tree at the center of the world, or that they sponta spontaneously form underground where dwarven miners can uncover them, or that they're personally created, each one is handcrafted by Bahamut or Tiamat, or that they arise from the bodies of enlightened humanoids, or that they're made by the decision of a council of dragons. Again, the whole idea here is just imagine these possibilities and go from there. That is- And the key idea with hordes, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying that's incredible. That's all, please go on. Um, the key idea with hordes is that, that all this material wealth that dragons collect is a focus for the magic that ties them to the material plane. So what are the implications of that? What sorts of cool art objects might you find? And how might you be able to diminish a dragon's power if you can manage to get some of their horde away from them? So that's another angle that we're exploring. It Really looking forward to all of this. Now, you mentioned a moment ago giant mimics. Uh, I know there's a full bestiary full of new monsters in this book. Do you in particular have a favorite, which I know is rough, the whole book is about dragons, but do you have a favorite new upcoming monster or foe that you can tell us about? So my favorite today, aside from the horde mimic, has gotta be the elder brain dragon. Um, so, you know, we've explained how mind flayers, these psionic creatures in the game, they, they reproduce by implanting tadpoles into the bodies of humanoid creatures that are then transformed into mind flayers. So the elder brain dragon is what happens when you take a mind flayer elder brain, this enormous brain that's the telepathic hub of a mind flayer community, and it normally lives in a big brine pool, but it implants itself onto the back of a dragon and extends its tendrils into the dragon's brain and body and takes it over and becomes mobile and horrifying and creepy and disgusting and I just love it. In, you know, for those of you that are familiar with my show, Black Dice Society, our horror stream, Ravenloft, I promise you an elder brain dragon is super not gonna show up in roughly four <laughs> weeks. This is the last we've heard of it. Don't give me that look back. No, this is, I promise, I promise. Last you heard of it, last you heard of it. Uh, as always, this D&D book is packed with awesome art. Can you talk about uh, what we're gonna be seeing or any of the contributors? Oh, I'm not super prepared to talk about this, but um, I will, yes. <laughs> Zone of safety, so you know, if it's, if it's NDAville, I get it. But if you can give us a tiny peek, we'd appreciate it. 
there's a, a just a ton of gorgeous dragon art throughout this book. Um, Ooh, one, we actually, I've, I've just been told we actually have some art that we can show, and then you can tell us what it is that we're seeing. So let, let's see what we what got That's what I was here. hoping for. <laughs> Good. Okay, so this is a, uh, a silver great worm, um, which is a, a dragon that is ancient and beyond ancient. Um, they are... So these hugely powerful dragons that manage to absorb some of the power from their echoes across the multiverse and so transcend the limits of any particular material plane world. Crystal Sully did this piece. It's just a, an amazing, wow, look at this dragon. You know, I think we might be able to get enough donations for our charity dragon, Dor Torvith, to reach that before this weekend is over. I think this will be a new record of how quickly a dragon has grown, but now we know what to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so these are, are uh, Gem Dragonborn, a sapphire amethyst and emerald dragonborn swapping stories around a fire. So these are uh, playable race dragonborn who are tied to the ancestry of the Gem Dragons, a new family of dragons that we introduced in this book to join the chromatic and metallic dragons in the monster manual. Awesome. Oh, and there's Fizban the Fabulous. Hey, he does look fabulous. He does, especially that scarf. Oh my gosh! You know, so he is known true. for <laughs> he is known for traveling you know, uh, across the material planes with canaries in his company. So you saw the bird well, perched on his finger. Well, you know, since this is Fizman's book, do we get a glimpse of the character throughout the pages as the fabulous wizard chimes in, uh, similar to how both Xanathar and Tasha provided commentary in their own eponymous books? Absolutely. Um, he, he has a lot to say. So Fizban is a, a character who appears in the Dragonlance novels, starting with um, Dragons of Autumn Twilight by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. And when we first meet him, he comes off as this sort of absent-minded, befuddled old wizard who can't seem to cast a spell correctly and maybe isn't quite sure where or even who he is. But the heroes help him out and then he helps them out. And eventually we learn that he's actually a manifestation of the god Paladin, the platinum dragon, who is known on other worlds as, as Bahamut. So it turns out that that's sort of Bahamut's shtick. He travels the world, travels all the worlds of the material plane in human guise, often accompanied by seven ancient gold dragons who are disguised as canaries. So he's our narrator. He's got a voice that is definitely quirky, sometimes utterly incomprehensible. But what I love about him as a character and the way we've used him here is that he's fundamentally kind. He, you know, Tasha and Mordenkainen are funny, but often in sarcastic or cynical ways. And Fizban is warm. He's a fundamentally compassionate being. And we've managed to inject that tone into this big badass book about dragons in a way that just delights me. You know, a as a firm adherent of Tiamat, I'm kind of anti-Bahamut, but that's okay. That's a choice. <laughs> you know, I'm still looking forward to the book. You know, we actually have one of the writers of Fizben's Quips here in the studio with us, I believe because she is the head writer of this very project. I don't see her here. Is she here? Yes! Amy Vorbel. Hello, Amy. Welcome. Yay, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Face shielded for safety. Look at this. Like we, we take care of each other here on the set. I yes. To take that off. Good. Uh, hello. Welcome. Thank, Thank you for you. joining us. Thank you for having me. You know, so you can now literally add to your resume writer of God quips. <laughs> yes, I am. I am a dragon. Let it be known. Literally, like it's canonical. We said it on the internet. It's true now. Yes, you know. Uh, totally. Can you give us? Hi, can, can you give us some idea what, what your contribution to the book was? Yes, I provided the color commentary um, for Fizban's Treasury of Dragons. So that means that I was, uh, anything that maybe Fizban had a thought about, um, boy, is it in there. And I, let me just tell you, Fizban has a lot of thoughts about dragons, so yeah. Uh, you wrote a lot of the lines and dialogue for Fizban. Yes. Um, can you tell me what led to your involvement in the project? Okay, I don't know because Wizards of the Coast is, um, you know, an ethereal being, um, oh. but I have oh. a sneaking suspicion that, uh, what? <laughs> apparently, they couldn't hear us. You and I were just doing that for each other. Well, I welcome, felt good about it. <laughs> welcome back, Peacock. I assure you, anything charming we said, we will repeat right now. Yeah. Uh, Amy, what led to your involvement in Fizzbane's tre Treasury of Dragons? Yes, so I think 
I, again, I'm I'm unclear, but I think uh, because Wizards is technically doesn't exist, it just exists in our imagination, and this is all a figment, a Fizbin figment. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that when um, I had written an adventure for Candlekeep Mysteries, mm -hmm. and it was uh, arguably the silliest adventure. <laughs> it was, so it was called Candlekeep Deconstruction, where a group of disgruntled janitors uh, in Candlekeep the Library um, got together and did something that makes adventurers explore the towers and you find out that the tower is something other than expected. So nothing silly there, no. disgruntled janitors. Yeah. And then I think they kind of did a two and two and thought, well, Fizman's a bit of a silly character, arguably, in, uh, in those novels. So I, I think that's why I got tapped. And I think that's why. Maybe James knows a little bit more. Or can you ask him? You know, you could literally all your training has led to this. You know? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, the Venn diagram of Amy is Fizman. <laughs> fabulous. It's, honestly, it is fabulous. <laughs> it is draconic. Yes. It is a deity in hiding. It is funny. <laughs> exactly. That is how I would describe you. Yes. You, well, uh, how did you work with James to develop Fizman's voice? Oh, awesome. Well, I want to hear. I want to hear James's answer too, but. Um, the main, I guess I'll start with the challenge of Fizbin. In mm. the novels, he's a bit, he's so silly that he's also forgetful. And when you're trying to say that it's Fizbin's treasury of dragons and he knows a lot about dragons, you can't also be like, right. every little quip that you write can't be like, I forgot, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's... That was a, a, a bit of a challenge because you do want to stay true to the character. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of got into a rhythm where Fizbin, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just tell you where I'm coming from with this kind of avatar that I decided Fizbin was with, mm -hmm. with James, mm -hmm. that he was definitely the older version of Fizbin. Mm -hmm. So anything that happened in the past, draconic, big old, you know, canon history, he, he, he treated it like any kind of, uh, if you have like a grandparent and they wax poetic about the days, they're like, sure, the depression, but I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. That long gone and it wasn't that big of a deal now that I come to think of it. And <laughs> like, so it's kind of that thing. Like, mm -hmm. yes, I guess we created the world, but blah, blah, blah. It wasn't, it wasn't a huge deal and, and nothing too far off the cuff for me. <laughs> um, also, uh, I kind of took some liberties and made him very much like a, musical theater dean of my university because this guy was very fizbin-y so like an old doddering kind of professor who loved musical theater loved singing and dancing sounds fabulous um, candy sweets all of that and and from there i think what we have now in the book is is on the right on the right path james anything that you want to throw in there about <laughs> developing fizbin's voice I was just going to say the bit about Fizbin teaching a Dracohydra to sing five-part harmony was gold. <laughs> 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 and Amy, your your interpretation of the story of how you came to work on this is pretty much dead on. Chris Perkins uh, suggested that I use you for this um, because of your work on Candlekeep and your professional background. You know, that is fantastic. Uh, thank you so much to James. Thank you to Amy for coming in to talk about Fizzbane's Treasury of Dragons. Uh, it is going to be released soon. I, I believe you can pre-order it now. October 19th should be the day. Uh, for more information about Fizzbane's Treasury of Dragons, uh, you can visit a website that I cannot read from here, it's but it's DungeonsAndDragons.com! I was gonna guess <laughs> DungeonsAndDragons.com. I was gonna guess it. I have LASIK! Just, 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 man, apparently I need it. But in the meantime, uh, we, oh, uh, soon we are gonna throw it over to somebody else, but I guess I'll give it to you for any one last word. Uh, you know, I will get last word from you, James, okay. and then I'll get last word from Amy. Any last words about Fizzbench Treasury of Dragons? I hope you have as much fun with it as we did. Perfect, perfect. And Amy? I just want to, I, I had the option of seeing how this all came together because I did have to provide commentary. And it is, <laughs> like, I mean, there's just everything that you could possibly want in Dragons in that book. So I encourage everyone to get it. I mean, you can add add so much to your adventures. It's not, the monsters aren't just dragons and it's not just the dragons as you know them, the entire layers and domains and treasures and eggs and everything, it's all covered. Any I've question been... you might have, it, it's just in there. So just enjoy no, and, and drink it right up. Uh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, I, I'm kind of still like sort of swimming around in my mind with some of the possibilities that that we've got going on here. Yeah. Uh, are you are you trying to think of how to kill your players with, with no, like a oh, friendly I've dragon? No, I've already thought okay. of how to kill the players. I'm thinking about how not okay. to kill the players. Fair enough. Uh, but uh, I believe we are ready to hand it over to Becca here. Now that we have given you the fizz bad and the fizz good uh, about all of this, you know I'm literally here all day. By the way, I'm, I'm back. I'm, I'm back I, tomorrow. I know I can't be the only one laughing at this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it may be but, just the two of us. That yeah, is true. Yeah, yeah. I'm watching Mika slowly die. Off set. Oh yeah, if, that, if, that if makes she sense. doesn't come back, it is because she has passed away yeah. from my delightful puns. Yes.